the contemporary relevance of prophecy introduction since the time of Moses, prophets served as an essential link between God and his people. Soon after the inauguration of the prophetic ministry and before Israel entered the land of Canaan, Moses spoke of a prophet that God would raise up after him, Deuteronomy 18 15-18. Paul Brown 1 Jack Deer 2 D. A. Carson 3 and John MacArthur 4 conclude that the future prophet about which Moses wrote is none other than Jesus Christ. Such a prophetic pronouncement finds fulfillment in the inspired words of Hebrews' author. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, Hebrews 1 1 2.5 In his high priestly prayer, Jesus acknowledged his prophetic function, for the words which you gave me I have given them, John 17 8. 1 Paule Brown, Deuteronomy, an expositional commentary, Leminster, UK, Day 1 Publications, 2008, Logos Bible Software, P150. 2 J.A.C.K. Deer, Deuteronomy, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, An Exposition of the Scriptures. Volume 1. Ed. John Walvoord and Roy Zuck, Wheaton, I.L., Victor Books, 1983, Logos Bible Software, P296. 3 D.A. Carson, France R.T., J.A. Modier, and Gordon Wenham E.D.S., New Bible Commentary. 4th ed. Leicester, UK, Intervarsity Press, 1994, Logos Bible Software, P217. 4JOHN MacArthur, ed. The MacArthur Study Bible, Nashville, TN, Word Publishing, 1997, Logos Bible Software, P276. 5 Unless otherwise indicated, all scripture is from the New American Standard Bible, Lockman Foundation, copyright copyright 1960, 1962, 1968, 1971, 1972, 1973, 1975, 1977, 1995. 1 Jesus' ascension did not mark the end of prophecy or the prophetic role. His command to the apostles was to wait for the Holy Spirit who would come not many days after his ascension, Acts 1 5. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the Holy Spirit came marking the fulfillment of Joel 2 28:30 and the inauguration of the church age. It was God's sovereign plan to employ apostles and prophets as servants fulfilling the foundational role of leadership and to be mediators of the divine revelation necessary for the stability and growth of the infant church. Ephesians 2 19-20 Their ministry of revelation and leadership produced a body of teaching that Jude referred to as the faith once for all handed down to the saints, Jude 3. In his doctoral dissertation, Rick Walston rightly concludes the uniqueness of these prophets stating, There are no prophets today that can be considered as being foundational, Ephesians 2.20, to the Gospel 6 Although prophets were foundational, and by the end of the first century, the church's foundation was firm, the Didache, written sometime around the late 1st to early 2nd century, indicates that early believers still held prophets in high regard. Point seven. Nevertheless, the Didache also records that with the diminishing numbers of prophets, bishops, elders, and deacons were performing the prophetic role. Point eight. In an attempt to reverse the trend, the 2nd century Montanist movement sought a forced continuance 6 R.I.C.K. Walston, the prophet and the gift of prophecy from Ph.D. Dis, the manifestations of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 with special emphasis upon tongues as evidence, Northwest University, 2000, 61 pages. 7 D.A.V.I.D. Hill, New Testament Prophecy, Basingstoke, UK, Marshall Morgan and Scott, 1979, P186. 8 The Didache, 15 1 2. Two of the miraculous gifts. It asserted above all the continuance of prophecy. 9 Philip Schaff concludes that the church did not deny, in theory, the continuance of prophecy but it disposed to derive the Montanistic revelations from satanic inspirations, 
and mistrusted them all the more for their proceeding not from the regular clergy, but in great part from unauthorized laymen and fanatical women. Point ten Eusbia citation of the Montanist prophetess Maximilla illustrates the reason for the church's mistrust. I am driven away from the sheep like a wolf. I am not a wolf. I am word and spirit and power. 11 In a scathing condemnation of Montanism, Eusbius expressed his disdain for the movement with the following acerbic words, the enemy of God's church, who is emphatically a hater of good and a lover of evil, and leaves untried no manner of craft against men, was again active in causing strange heresies to spring up against the church. For some persons, like venomous reptiles, crawled over Asia and Phrygia, boasting that Montanus was the paraclete, and that the women that followed him, Priscilla and Maximilla were prophetesses of Montanus. Point 12 The Montanist movement of the mid-2nd century became the watershed occasion for analyzing the relevance of the post-apostolic gift of prophecy. The vitriolic pushback against Montanism facilitated a long-standing controversy that continues to this day. The heart of the controversy questions the longevity and relevancy of the New Testament gift of prophecy. One side of the issue believes that the prophecy continues 9 Philip Schaff and David Sly Schaff, History of the Christian Church Vol. 2, New York, New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1910, Logos Bible Software, p. 423. 10 Ibid, p. 424. 11 Eusbius, Ecclesiastical History Book V, p. 108. 12 Ibid, p. 106. 3 Unabated from its use in the New Testament, a view known as Continuationism 13, the other side believes that the gift of prophecy ended with the completion of the New Testament canon, a view known as Cessationism 14. In addition to these opposing views, Wayne Grudem suggests that there may be a tenable third position, can a fresh examination of the New Testament give us a resolution of these views? Does the text of Scripture itself indicate a middle ground or a third position which preserves what is really important to both sides and yet is faithful to the teaching of the New Testament? I think the answer to these questions is yes 15 It is the hope of a viable third position concerning the gift of prophecy that moves this researcher to concur with Grudem's suggestion that the New Testament does present a third position. What is the third position? The answer to this question emerges when one considers what the Bible says about the function of the prophet and prophecy, prophets and prophecy in the Old Testament and New Testaments, and the relevancy of prophets and prophecy today. 1-3 J.O.H.N. MacArthur and Richard Mayhew, eds, Biblical Doctrine, A Systematic Summary of Bible Truth, Wheaton, I.L., Crossway Books, 2017, p. 804. 1-4 W.A.Y.N.E. Grudem, The Gift of Prophecy in the New Testament and Today, Wheaton, I.L., Crossway Books, 2000, Kindle Electronic Edition, p. 15. 15 Ibid, p. 17. For the function of the prophet and prophecy the primary Old Testament word for prophet, Nabi, refers to a spokesman, a speaker, or one who speaks on behalf of another. Point 16 Grudem concludes, the main function of Old Testament prophets was to be messengers from God, sent to speak to men and women with words from God. 17 Similarly, the definition of the New Testament word, prophetvi, prophets, refers to one who speaks openly, makes known publicly, or one who makes a proclamation. Point 18 In one of the first biblical narratives depicting the prophetic function, Moses' relationship with Aaron and Aaron's relationship with Pharaoh aptly illustrates the functional role of the prophet. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you, when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you and you will be as God to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land, 
Exodus 4 colon 14 16, 7 colon 1 2. 16 Robert L. Harris, Gleason L. Archer, and Bruce K. Waltke, eds Theological Wordbook of the Old Testament, Chicago, I.L., Moody Press, 1999, Logos Bible Software, P544. 17 Grudem, P21. 18 Gerhard Frederick, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament Vol. 6, eds Gerhard Kittel, Jeffrey W. Bromilly, and Gerhard Friedrich, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1964, Logos Bible Software, p. 781. 5. In Moses' case, the prophetic function involved three characters. God, who was the source of the content that Moses would give to Aaron. Aaron served as the spokesman who communicated God's words, which he received through Moses, to Pharaoh. Thus, Moses became like God to Pharaoh, Moses being the immediate source of Aaron's message, and Aaron became like Moses' prophet, the one who proclaimed his message. When Aaron delivered the message to Pharaoh, he was not free to ad lib. His task was to deliver the message exactly as Moses had put the words in his mouth, Exodus 4.15. At the call of Jeremiah, God confirmed the same process by assuring Jeremiah that the content of the prophet's message did not come from himself. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb I knew you, and before you were born I consecrated you, I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God! Behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth, Jeremiah 1,4-9. The same structural framework existed for every true prophet of the Lord, God would deliver the message to the prophet, and the prophet delivered God's message to whomever God directed him. Moses was the inaugural prototype of the prophetic function, and he served as the foreshadowing of Jesus' intermediary prophetic role, Deuteronomy 18,15-18. Prophecy and Prophets in the Old Testament At the initiation of Israel's independence from Egyptian bondage, God established the credibility of the prophetic office through distinctive miracles, which he performed six through Moses to testify to the veracity of the prophet and the prophet's message, Exodus 4 1 9. After Moses, Elijah, and Elisha performed many attesting miracles, thus establishing the stability and credibility of the prophetic office. When Elijah raised the widow's son from the dead, she said, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. 1 Kings 17:24. The widow rightly connected Elijah's God-given power with the authenticity of his prophetic role. Once God established the credibility of the prophetic function, there was no longer the need to perform attesting miracles. The result is that God delivered his message through prophets without performing attesting miracles. The Bible records no miracles performed by the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Daniel, Nahum, Habakkuk, and other prophetic authors included in the Old Testament canon. Nevertheless, God's establishment and stabilization of the prophetic ministry did not eliminate the need for the verification of an individual prophet's message. By emulating verbal formulas used by true prophets of God, false prophets regularly led people astray. The presence of such deceivers precipitated the need for tests designed to help people discern the authenticity of the prophet and his message. God provided the people with different criteria by which they might distinguish between a false and true prophet. Deuteronomy 13,1-5 records the first criterion by which one can identify a false prophet, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with seven. 
all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Although a prophet may, like the magicians of Pharaoh's court, Exodus 7:11-12, perform signs and wonders to demonstrate his veracity, those signs are meaningless if he intends to lead people away from the commandments of the Lord. Point 19 Therefore, the content of a prophet's message must not contradict the previously established and verified message of God. When God delivered the commandments to Israel through Moses, they were not open for negotiation or revision by the words of a later prophet. When a prophet spoke for God, his message must cohere to revealed truth. In Deuteronomy 18, 20-22, Moses presented another criterion by which one may discern the verity of prophets, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. The standard for true prophets of God is accuracy. Verse 20 indicates that the presumptuous or idolatrous prophet was subject to capital punishment. But how would the people know? The answer is accuracy, if a prophet proclaims that something will 190 UANEL Christensen, Word Biblical Commentary, Deuteronomy 1-21-9 vol. 6a, ed. John D. W. Watts, Nashville, T.N., Thomas Nelson, 2001, Logos Bible Software, p. 272. 8. Happen, it must come true, Deuteronomy 18.22. Dwayne Christensen points out that Moses' answer is incomplete because one cannot make an on-the-spot judgment of a prophecy that may not come to pass for 70 years, i.e., Jeremiah 29 colon 10, point 20 Christensen's argument is valid if Moses intended to communicate zero-based prophecy by disregarding the prophet's historical accuracy. But isolation does not appear to be the pattern manifested in the Old Testament. True prophets of God were always accurate in all of their prophecies. Consequently, Grudem observes that one does not find in the Old Testament any instance where the prophecy of someone who is acknowledged to be a true prophet is evaluated or sifted so that the good might be sorted from the bad, the true from the false. 21 Grudem is correct as it relates to the sifting of every prophetic utterance made by one who was known to be a true prophet of God. Nevertheless, one's historical accuracy does not eliminate the possibility of future presumption, so the standard of total accuracy still applied. Hence, Moses saw the need to give a criterion by which the people could evaluate the continuing accuracy of God's prophet. As long as the prophet's predictions came true, the people were obligated to listen, Deuteronomy 18:19. God did not leave room for a true prophet to utter both true and false prophecies. Moses' description of the evaluation process is as clear as it is simple. He taught Israel that when a prophet spoke in the name of the Lord, they must listen to him, but if the thing which the prophet spoke did not come true, they were to conclude that God had not spoken to the prophet and they should not fear him, Deuteronomy 18.22. Although the 20 Ibid, p. 410. 21 Grudem, p. 23. Nine prophet may have been faithful for years, just one false prophecy categorized the speaker as a false prophet, i.e., one through whom God had not spoken, and as such he was subject to death according to Deuteronomy 18. Carson observes that once a prophet was tested and approved in the Old Testament, God's people were morally bound to obey him. To disobey such a prophet was to oppose God. If a prophet speaking in the name of God was shown to be in error, the official sanction was death. But once a prophet is acknowledged as true, 
there is no trace of repeated checks on the content of his oracles. Point 22 Carson's assertion that there is no trace of repeated checks on the content of his oracles. 23 does not appear to concur with Moses' teaching in Deuteronomy 18. Carson rightly echoed what Moses said in verse 19, that the people must listen to, obey, the prophet who speaks in the Lord's name. However, in verse 20, Moses commanded the death of any prophet who spoke presumptuously. The Israelites' question in verse 21 indicates that the speaker was not yet considered a false prophet. Moses tied the prophet to his prophecy so tightly that a presumptuous message resulted not only in the rejection of the message but also in the death of the prophet. Although Carson asserts that there is no trace of repeated checks of the content of a prophet's oracle, the accuracy test instituted by Moses required people to maintain consistent and vigilant scrutiny of any prophetic prediction. The same atmosphere of prophetic scrutiny, which was intended to protect people against going astray by false prophets, carried over to the New Testament era. 2 2 D.A. Carson, Showing the Spirit, A Theological Exposition of 1 Corinthians 1214, Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Books, 1987, p. 94. 2 3 IBID 10 Prophecy and Prophets in the New Testament Like their Old Testament counterparts, New Testament prophets also underwent an examination of their prophecies, 1 Thessalonians 5 19 22 and 1 Corinthians 14 29. Jesus himself encourages an atmosphere of scrutiny. In Matthew 7 15, Jesus commanded examination, Beware of the false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Also, toward the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus warned his disciples that many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Matthew 24 colon 11. A few verses later, Jesus said, Four false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24 colon 24. The Bereans, who tested Paul's words against previously delivered Old Testament revelation, Acts 17 11, also illustrate that an environment of testing prophetic utterance existed early in the New Testament church. Interestingly, on the basis of the Bereans' cautious skepticism of Paul's message, Luke noted that the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. Toward the end of the first century, the Apostle John exhorted, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world, 1 John 4 colon 1. The persistent existence and cunning of false prophets have not diminished over time precipitating the need for continued examination of prophetic utterances. The specific method employed in the authentication of New Testament prophets and prophecies varied based on the nature of the prophet and his prophecy. The Apostle Paul taught a standard for prophecy like that which was taught by Moses in Deuteronomy 13, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to eleven exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, Romans 12 colon 6. The translators of the New American Standard Bible imply, by their use of the possessive pronoun, that faith is subjective. However, John Calvin and other theologians, such as Leon Morris 24 Richard Lenski 25 John Whitmer 26 David on 27 and R.C. Sproul 28, understood faith in the objective sense. Thus Calvin translated the verse, Let him who has prophecy tested by the analogy of faith 29 Lenski translates the phrase as, According to the proportion of the faith 30 Thomas Schreiner, speaking about the word proportion, concludes that aginalagiva on this scheme means standard or rule. The idea of the phrase, then, is that those who prophesy must not deviate from apostolic doctrine 31 David Hill agrees, 2 for Leo N. Morris, the Epistle to the Romans, in the Pillar New Testament Commentary, Grand Rapids, M.I., InterVarsity Press, 1988, Logos Bible Software, p. 441. 2 5 R.C.H. Lenski, the interpretation of St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, Columbus, O. Lutheran Book Concern, 1936, Logos Bible Software, p. 761. 26 J. O. H. N. Whitmer, 
Romans, The Bible Knowledge Commentary, An Exposition of Scripture, Vol. 2, ed. John Walvoord and Roy Zuck, Wheaton, I.L., Victor Books, 1985, Logos Bible Software, P488. 270 AVID on, Prophecy in Early Christianity and the Ancient Mediterranean World, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1983, P204. 28RC Sproul, The Gospel of God, An Exposition of Romans, Ross Shire, UK, Christian Focus, 1994, Logos Bible Software, P200. 29JOH and Calvin, Commentary on the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, Trans. John Owen, Bellingham, W.A., Logos Bible Software, 2010, Logos Bible Software, P459. 30 Lenski, The Interpretation of St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, P758. 31 Thomas Schreiner, Romans, in Baker Exegetically Commentary on the New Testament, Vol. 6, Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Books, 1998, Logos Bible Software, P655. 12. One important restraint upon the prophet is the demand that he should exercise the gift kata ten analogen tes pistios, ROM 12 colon 6, i.e., as von Kampenhausen and Kaysman and others interpret the phrase, in agreement with the faith as proclaimed by the apostles, the fides qui creditor.32 Although Harold Guy rightly agrees that the phrase according to the proportion of the faith restricts prophecy, he believes the restricting force is the individual prophet's faith and not the body of apostolic doctrine.33 Faith, in the objective sense disambiguates the restriction placed on the one who exercises the gift of prophecy, and it concurs with other New Testament teaching that implies support for the objective view of faith. Paul urges the Corinthians, let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment, 1 Corinthians 14 29. According to Bauer, Danker, Ardent, and Gingrich, BDAG, the word translated judgment means to evaluate by paying careful attention to or to pass judgment on 34 Johannes Lu and Eugene Nita go further as they define Diacrino as to make a judgment on the basis of careful and detailed information 35 Paul's imperative not only implies a standard by which to judge a prophet's message, but it also 32 D.A.V.I.D. Hill, New Testament Prophecy, Basingstoke, UK, Marshall Morgan and Scott, 1985. Logos Bible Software, P130. 33 Harold Guy, New Testament Prophecy, London, UK, The Etworth Press, 1947, P.96. 34 William Arndt, Frederick Danker, Walter Bauer, and F. Wilbur Gingrich, A Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament and Other Early Christian Literature, Chicago, I.L., The University of Chicago Press, 2000, Logos Bible Software, P231. 35 Johannes Lu and Eugene A. Nita, Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament, based on semantic domains, Vol. 1, New York, New York, United Bible Societies, 1996, Logos Bible Software, P363. 13 suggests a truth restriction that is consistent with an objective understanding of faith in Romans 12 6. Paul also addresses the examination of prophetic utterances in his letter to the Thessalonians. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5 19 22. The object of verse 20 is the word prophetiva, propheteia, a word that refers to the utterance or act of prophesying. 36 The New American Standard Bible translates the word as prophetic utterances because the accusative plural form of the noun is anarthrus 37, thus focusing not on a particular individual but prophetic utterances in general. 38 Paul commanded that the Thessalonians must examine prophetic utterances carefully. The original Greek word translated examine, in verse 21, is the word dekamavsw, dekamadzo. 
the word means to examine something to determine its genuineness critically. 39 FF Bruce suggests that no criteria are suggested here for distinguishing genuine prophecy from false, consistency with revelation already received would be one obvious test. 43 6 ARNDT, Danker, Bauer, and Gingrich, P889. 37 KURT Allen, Barbara Allen, Johannes Caravido Polos, Carlo Martini, and Bruce Metzger, Novum Testamentum Grice. 28th ed. Stuttgart, De, Deutsche Bielgesellschaft, 2012, Logos Bible Software, P629. 38 Charles Wanamaker, The Epistles to the Thessalonians, A Commentary on the Greek Text, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1990, Logos Bible Software, P202. 39 ARNDT, Danker, Bauer, and Gingrich, P255. 40 FF Bruce, Word Biblical Commentary, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Vol 45. Dallas, TX, Word, 1998, Logos Bible Software, P 125. 14 The Apostolic Exhortations to Examine, Judge, and Test Prophecies point to a concurrent standard for Old and New Testament prophets. However, the persistent charge to examine prophecies does not necessitate that New Testament prophecy is identical in every respect to Old Testament prophecy. In its essential form, the prophetic function in the New Testament era remains the same in the Old. In both eras, God delivered a message to his prophet, and it was the prophet's responsibility to transmit God's message accurately without presumptuous additions or deletions. Robert Saucy confirms the continuity of Old Testament and New Testament prophecy by noting that the Spirit's work of inspiration in prophecy goes all the way to the actual prophecy, that is, the words spoken or written 41 The recipients of a prophetic utterance validated the message by previously established orthodoxy and complete accuracy of the prophet's predictions. However, the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell the lives of believers changed the context in which prophecy functioned. To the church at Corinth, Paul said, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, 1 Corinthians 12,7. One of the more contended manifestations of the Spirit is the gift of prophecy because the gift of prophecy is not limited to prophets. 42 The Apostle Paul makes an important distinction between the gift of prophecy and the office or ministry of a prophet. There is no doubt that Paul considered prophecy as a 41WAYNE Grudem ed. Are miraculous gifts for today? Four Views, Grand Rapids, M.I., Zondervan, 1996. Kindle Electronic Edition, Location 4294. 42 RICK Walston, The Prophet and the Gift of Prophecy from Ph.D. Dis, The Manifestations of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 with Special Emphasis upon Tongues as Evidence, Northwest University, 2000, 61 pages. 15 Spiritual Gift, Romans 12 6, 1 Corinthians 12:10. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, Romans 12 6. And again, Paul says, Now there are varieties of gifts and to another prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12 4, 10. Conversely, in 1 Corinthians 12 28, Paul writes, And God has appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, their teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. In verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 12, when referring to the gift of prophecy, Paul uses the word prophetia. Prophetia is the same word he used in 1 Thessalonians 5.20 and Romans 12.6. In each case, Paul's word choice focuses on one's ability to give a prophetic message. Point 43 Significantly, in Paul's reference to prophets, 1 Corinthians 12 28, he does not use prophetia, rather, he chooses to use the word prophets. Prophets speaks of the person who is a proclaimer or revealer of divine matters that could not ordinarily be known. Point 44 Concerning 1 Corinthians 12 28, 
Carson notes, the second list enumerates the first three entries, first, second, third, and uses personal categories for them, apostles, prophets, teachers, 45 John MacArthur, agreeing with Carson adds, the text here affirms that prophets were also appointed by God as specially gifted men, and differ from those believers who have the gift of prophecy. 46 Walston also concludes, just because God uses someone to prophesy, 143 Frederick, p. 783. 44 ARNDT, Danker, Bauer, and Gingrich, p. 890. 45 Carson, p. 36. 46 JOH and MacArthur, MacArthur New Testament Commentary, 1 Corinthians, Chicago, IL, Moody Press, 1984, Logos Bible Software, p. 323. 16 Corinthians 12:10, it does not follow that said person is then a prophet, Ephesians 4:11.47 in his commentary on Ephesians. Andrew Lincoln connects the gifted people given by Christ in Ephesians 4:11 with the God-appointed ministers in 1 Corinthians 12:28.48 that Paul intended such a connection seems clear by the consistency with which apostles and prophets as God-given people appear in his letters 1 Corinthians 12:28 Ephesians 2:20 3:5:4:11 In each passage the order is the same in 1 Corinthians 12:28, apostles, prophets, and teachers are distinct from other gifts, not people, that God gave to the church. In Ephesians 2:20, Paul likens the church as God's household, which he built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Again, in Ephesians 3:5, Paul identifies the significant role of apostles and prophets for it was through them that God revealed the mystery of Christ to the church. Paul's distinction between prophets and prophecies provokes questions about the nature and ministry of prophets, as well as the function of the gift of prophecy. Answers to these questions begin by a careful consideration of the special group of people called prophets. There exists an inherent danger for those who seek to identify the position of the prophet in the early church. The danger consists of the different criteria by which a one deems another a prophet. Some scholars delineate the prophet from a theological perspective. This perspective may lead one to conclude that there is no difference for 7 R.I.C.K. Walston, the prophet and the gift of prophecy from Ph.D. Dis, the manifestations of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 with special emphasis upon tongues as evidence, Northwest University, 2000, 61 pages. 48 Andrew Lincoln, Word Biblical Commentary, Ephesians, Dallas, TX, Word, 1990, Logos Bible Software, P249. 17 Between Old Testament and New Testament Prophets.49 Or, such a perspective can lead to one concluding that the apostles are the counterparts of Old Testament prophets.50 Although the influence of one's theological position can lead to a well defined prophet, it may hinder one from faithfully handling scriptures that indicate something contrary to the scholar's theological norm. Others seem to define the prophet from a phenomenological viewpoint. Grudem demotes the authority of New Testament prophecy, in part, because Paul disobeyed those who, by the Spirit, kept telling him not to set foot in Jerusalem, Acts 21 4-5.51 Grudem's conclusion makes sense from the way things appear. However, one must consider the historical norm that indicates a pattern of Paul's obedience to the Spirit's commands, Acts 16, 6-7, 18, 9-10, 26, 19. Given the Apostles' obedient history, a viable alternative to Grudem's conclusion exists. It is feasible that the believers were urging Paul because of the Spirit's revelation about what he was to endure in Jerusalem.52 in this case, consideration of Paul's context can lead one to a different conclusion than seems apparent by limited observation. 49 Basileish Link, ruled by the Spirit, translated by John and Mary Foote and Michael Harper, Minneapolis, MN, Bethany, 1969, p. 43. 50 Grudem, p. 29. 51 Ibid, p. 75. 
52 Merrill Tenney and Richard Longnecker, The Expositor's Bible Commentary, John and Acts, Vol. 9, ed. By Frank Gabelin, Grand Rapids, M.I., Zondervan, 1981, Logos Bible Software, p. 516. 18 Finally, one may also seek to define the New Testament prophet from an exegetically perspective. In this approach, conclusions emerge only from the biblical text. The exegetically approach does not preclude textual implications, but it does rule out standalone assumptions that have little or no footing in the text. What follows is a summary of what the New Testament describes as a prophet. That the Bible indicates a difference between the prophet as a person called and given to the church by God, and the one who regularly or occasionally functions as a prophet, is clear. In 1 Corinthians 12:28, Ephesians 2:20, 3 colon 5, and 4 11, the Apostle Paul speaks of apostles and prophets. Of special interest is the grammatical construction of the apostles and prophets in Ephesians 2:20. According to A.T. Robertson, when an author refers to groups that are more or less distinct, but he intends to treat them as one, the use of only one article occurs. Point 53 Importantly, Robertson's explanation of a single definite article governing multiple groups does not preclude the existence of distinctive groups. Max Zierwick and Mary Grosvenor agree with Robertson, suggesting that the subordination of apostles and prophets under one article indicates a close association. Point 54 Paul's references to the apostles and prophets, 1 Corinthians 12:28 and Ephesians 4:11, intentionally show the two groups as distinct. Richard Gaffin noting Ephesians 4.11, concludes that it shows that the prophets mentioned earlier in 2.20 and 3.5 are along 5.3a. T. Robertson, A Grammar of the Greek New Testament in the Light of Historical Research, Nashville, T.N., Broadman Press, 1934, Logos Bible Software, p. 787. 5.4 M.A.X. Zierwick and Mary Grosvenor, A Grammatical Analysis of the Greek New Testament, Rome, IT, Biblical Institute Press, 1974, Logos Bible Software, p. 582. 19 with the Apostles, but distinct from them 55 however, Grudem believes that Paul's references to Apostles and Prophets in Ephesians 2.20 and 3.5 are not talking about two groups of people, Apostles and Prophets, but about one group, Apostle Prophets 56 in support of his view. Grudem suggests that the Greek grammar makes such a conclusion possible and is consistent with Paul's grammatical usage in Ephesians 4.11 about pastors teachers. Point 57 Lenski concurs with Grudem that the grammatical construction of pastors and teachers, in Ephesians 4.11, makes them one class of leaders. Point 58 The same conclusion appears in William Hendrickson's commentary on Ephesians. Point 59 However, Paul designates apostles and prophets separately. 1 Corinthians 12:28 and Ephesians 4:11. Therefore, the extent to which one may consider both groups, Ephesians 2:20, 3:5, as one class is that both groups were foundational to the establishment of the church, and both groups received new revelation from God to establish a body of doctrine for the church. Kenneth Gentry indicates that the contextual flow of Ephesians 2:20 and 3:55 Richard Gaffin Perspectives on Pentecost, New Testament Teaching on the Gifts of the Holy Spirit, Phillipsburg, New Jersey, Presbyterian and Reformed, 1979, p. 94. 56 Grudem, p. 330. 57 Ibid, p. 340. 58 R.C.H. Lenski, The Interpretation of St. Paul's Epistle to the Galatians, to the Ephesians and to the Philippians, Columbus, O, Lutheran Book Concern, 1937, Logos Bible Software, p. 528. 59 William Hendrickson and Simon Kistmaker, New Testament Commentary, Exposition of Ephesians. Volume 7, Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Books, 1953-2000, Logos Bible Software, p. 197.
20 Govern Paul's distinctive use of apostles and prophets in Ephesians 4 11.60 The hermeneutic rules of context direct that without any specific indication to the contrary, the reference in Ephesians 2.20, 3 colon 5, and 4.11 were the same in each passage. Point 61 Grudem also supports his view by appealing to Revelation 21.12, which states, And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Initially, the connection appears plausible, but a problem emerges upon closer examination. The foundation of the apostles and prophets in Ephesians 2.20 is a reference to the foundation upon which Christ builds his church, Matthew 16, 16-18. Congruently, Ephesians 2.19-20 speaks of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Paul conflates household and church in his letter to Timothy. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. There are two significant differences between Ephesians 2.20 and Revelation 21.14 that call Grudem from his apostles' prophet view into question. First, in Revelation 21.14, the apostles' names are written on foundation stones of the wall of New Jerusalem, but the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church in Ephesians 2.20. Although one might amalgamate the foundation idea of both passages, there are no grounds for conflating the wall with the church. The second problem with Grudem's U60 Kenneth Gentry, the charismatic gift of prophecy, fountain in, S.C., Victorious Hope Publishing, 1989, p. 27. 61 Bernard Ram, Protestant Biblical Interpretation, A Textbook of Hermeneutics, Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Academic, 1970, p. 138. 21 of Revelation 21.14 is the absence of Christ's participation as the chief cornerstone of the Church, Ephesians 2.20, 1 Peter 2.4-6. It is best to conclude that apostles and prophets were distinct groups of people who were given to the church as gifts upon Christ's ascension, Ephesians 4, 8, 11. In addition to foundational prophets mentioned above, the New Testament refers to the ministry of non-foundational prophets. These prophets include 14 unnamed prophets and prophetesses, Acts 11, 27, 13, 1, 21, 9, Point 62 Other non-foundational prophets are mentioned by name, such as Agabus, Acts 11:27, 27, 21, 10, and Judas and Silas, Acts 15:32. As prophets given to the church, they are expected infallibly to convey God's message to his people. Although these prophets are not foundational, i.e., delivering the revelatory prophecy of Scripture, they, nevertheless, communicated God's messages and were bound by the same standards of accuracy as any other true prophet. Of the non-foundational prophets mentioned in the New Testament, Agabus draws the most attention. Unlike Bar-Jesus, whom Luke designates as a Jewish false prophet, Acts 13, 6, his designation of Agabus was simply a prophet, Acts 21, 10. In Acts 11, 27-28, Luke recorded Agabus accurate prediction of a famine that verified him as a true prophet of God. Now at this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius, Acts 11 27-28. According to Moses' standard of fulfilled predictions, Deuteronomy 18:22. Agabus was a true prophet who accurately spoke God's words. 62 AUNE, p. 196. 22 The accuracy of Agabus' former prophecy notwithstanding, some diminish his prophetic authority because of Paul's unresponsiveness. Still, others doubt the infallibility of New Testament prophecy asserting errant proclamations in Agabus' second prophecy. Luke testifies, as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands, and said, 
this is what the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Acts 21.10-11, as a proponent of the fallibility of Agabus prophecy, Grudem concludes that the prophet's prediction was nearly correct but not quite 63 he explains that the prophecy had inaccuracies in detail that would have called into question the validity of any Old Testament prophet 64 likewise, Carson suggests that the Jews did not bind Paul the Romans did, and the Jews did not hand Paul over to the Romans but sought to kill him. Point 65 he also states, I can think of no reported old. Testament prophet whose prophecies are so wrong on the details 66 Grudem highlights what he considers to be an error in Agabus prophecy by asserting that the Romans, not the Jews, bound Paul, v 33, also 22 29, and the Jews, rather than delivering him voluntarily, tried to kill him and he had to be rescued by force 67 one cannot ignore the apparent discrepancies associated with 63 Grudem, systematic theology, p. 1052. 6.4 IBID 65 Carson, location 1576. 66 Ibid, location 1579. 67 Grudem, Systematic Theology, p. 1052. 23 Agabus Prophecy. Further investigation of apparent erroneous claims in Agabus prophecy may lead one to conclude that Agabus was a true prophet who spoke accurately, he was not a true prophet, or he once was a true prophet, but his prophecy, concerning Paul, was presumptuous. Grudem attempts to resolve the Agabus problem as follows, the prediction was not far off, but it had inaccuracies in detail that would have called into question the validity of any Old Testament prophet. On the other hand, this text could be perfectly well explained by supposing that Agabus had had a vision of Paul as a prisoner of the Romans in Jerusalem, surrounded by an angry mob of Jews. His own interpretation of such a vision or revelation from the Holy Spirit would be that the Jews had bound Paul and handed him over to the Romans, and that is what Agabus would, somewhat erroneously, prophesy.68 by his admission, Grudem based his solution on a supposition. Contestants of Grudem's assertion believe that scripture does show that Agabus' prophecy was accurate appealing to the account Paul provides the Jews upon his arrival in Rome. After three days Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews, and when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Acts 28,17 in response, Grudem contends that the Greek text of Acts 28 17 does not support such a conclusion. Instead, he suggests that Paul's reference describes his transfer out of the Jewish judicial system. 69 He continues, the verse does not point to a fulfillment of either half of Agabus' prophecy, it does not mention any binding by the Jews, nor does it mention that the Jews handed Paul over to the Romans. 70 68 Grudem, Systematic Theology, p. 1052. 69 IBID 70 Ibid, p. 1053. 24 However, Grudem comes short of stating that Agabus is a false prophet or at least a true prophet who spoke presumptuously. Instead, the solution he suggests is that New Testament prophecy may be fallible. Although, such a solution seems to give Agabus the grace to err, is the fallibility of Agabus' prophecy sufficiently supported in scripture, or does a closer consideration of biblical and exegetical clues suggest a different conclusion? As a starting point, the contextual elements associated with Agabus' prophecy are informative. After Agabus delivered his prophecy, Luke recorded, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place, and besides he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul they dragged him out of the temple, 
and immediately the doors were shut. Acts 21 colon 2730, Grudem rightly concludes that the text does not specifically mention any binding by the Jews. However, the text does not preclude Paul's binding either. Neither conclusions emerge from information found in the primary text but which answer drawn from silence best coincides with the broader contextual indications. It is this question that occupies the following paragraphs. In Acts 24, Luke documented an account of Paul's defense before Governor Felix. The high priest Ananias came to the meeting with some elders and the Jewish plaintiff's attorney named Tertullus, verse 1. Tertullus accused Paul of being a pest, one who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, and one who desecrated the temple, verses 2 to 6. For such crimes as these, Tertullus reported, we arrested him, verse 6. Tertullus' presentation of the 25 charges in conjunction with his pronouncement of arrest implies a formal arrest that typically included binding. 71 Jesus' arrest by the Jews illustrates the association between arrest and binding practiced by the temple police. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. John 18:12. In the case of Jesus' arrest, George Beasley Murray concludes that the Jewish temple police made the arrest and the Roman soldiers were present to prevent trouble at the arrest. Point 72 The word used to speak of Jesus' arrest is the same word Tertullus used for arrest in Acts 24 colon 6. It comes from the Greek word kratevo, kratio. In the New Testament, kratio means to seize, or to hold. 73 The word is used of John the Baptist's arrest, Mark 6 17, where Mark combines John's arrest with his also being bound. Earlier in Acts, Luke associates the idea of seizure and binding to speak of the impossibility of Jesus' confinement in death's power. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power, Acts 2.24. Other contexts in which the word cardio appears imply the presence of restraint because the one subjected to the seizure was an unwilling participant, Mark 12.12, 12, 14.51. Whether stated directly or implied by the context of the passage, there exists a consistent connection between seizure, arrest equals cardio, and binding. Therefore, it is 71 Michael John Beasley, the fallible prophets of New Calvinism, Faftown, NC, The Armory Ministries, 2013, p. 83. 72 George Beasley Murray, John, Word Biblical Commentary, Vol. 36, Dallas, TX, Word Incorporated, 2002, Logos Bible Software, P323. 73, Gerhard Frederick, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament Vol. 3, EDS Gerhard Kittle, Jeffrey W. Bromilly, and Gerhard Friedrich, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1964, Logos Bible Software, P. 911. 26. Reasonable to conclude that the Jews, at least in some manner, did bind Paul before the Romans stepped in. Such a conclusion is consistent with the normal association of arrest and binding seen in other passages. Another problem with the credibility of Agabus' prophecy relates to his statement that the Jews would hand Paul over to the Gentiles, Romans. Agabus prophesied that the Jews at Jerusalem will deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles, Acts 21:11. Later, Paul states, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, Acts 28:17. Grudem believes that Paul's statement does not precisely cohere with Agabus' prophecy. 74 In the case of Agabus' prophecy and Paul's later statement to the Jews in Rome, the word translated delivered, Paradidomy, is the same. Paradidomy means to hand over, turn over, or give up a person, to hand over custody to police and courts. Point 75 However, Grudem suggests that it was merely a transfer from Jewish judicial authority to the Roman judiciary. Point 76 The relevance of Grudem's point resides in the timing of that transfer. Beasley rightly notes that the moment Roman centurions bound Paul in chains and brought him to the barracks, Acts 21 31 34, 
he was under the judicial custody of the Romans. Point 77 Paul's statement, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, Acts 28 17, points to the fact that Paul was already a prisoner when delivered from Jerusalem to the series of judicial inquests that ultimately 74 grew him, Systematic Theology, p. 1052. 75 ARNDT, Danker, Bauer, and Gingrich, p. 231. 76 Grudem, Systematic Theology, p. 1052. 77 Beasley, p. 94. 27 Led to his Roman imprisonment. Paul was a prisoner of Rome before being moved to Caesarea, Acts 23 2335, and when he was returned to Jerusalem to stand before Festus and Agrippa, Acts 25-26. These two passages support that Paul was a prisoner of Rome long before his final departure from Jerusalem. The Jews had to appeal to the Romans for the fulfillment of their desire that Paul would get the death penalty, which is evidence that Paul was already out of their judicial authority. The Romans gave Paul the chance to speak to the Jews on his behalf, Acts 21:37-40. As Paul spoke, Luke recorded the Jews' reaction, they listened to him up to the statement, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live, Acts 22:22. After Paul gave his defense before Festus, he appeared before Agrippa. By way of introduction, Festus said to Agrippa, King Agrippa, and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Acts 25 25 in both cases, Paul was in the custody of the Romans while the Jews appealed to them for Paul's execution. The point of transition from Jewish judicial authority to Roman authority occurred when the Jews arrested Paul in the temple, Acts 22 22 23, 24 6, and then the Romans took Paul into the barracks, Acts 21 33 34. Such timing and transfer are consistent with Agabus prophecy. Hence, Agabus prophecy was accurate, and Luke's narrative does present Paul's arrest, binding, and deliverance from the Jews to the Gentiles. Paul's testimony in Acts 28 17, taken in context, confirms Agabus' accuracy. Agabus and other non foundational prophets delivered God given messages to the church for encouragement, guidance, and support. As true prophets, they were subject to 28 the same infallible standard as any prophet who spoke for God. The response of the hearers does not determine the legitimacy or infallibility of prophets or their prophecies. Israel's response to their prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel did not call into question either the accuracy or authority of their prophetic messages. Paul's apparent indifference toward Agabus prophecy does not signify diminished accuracy or importance of New Testament prophecy. In addition to foundational and non-foundational prophets, another manifestation of prophecy in the New Testament is the gift of prophecy. The Apostle Paul's references to the gift of prophecy, Romans 12:6, 1 Corinthians 12:10, 13:2, are clearly different than his references to prophets, 1 Corinthians 12:28, Ephesians 2:20, 3:5, 4:11. Walston insightfully concludes. One of the most common mistakes made by interpreters is that of confusing the gift of prophet, Ephesians 4:11, with the gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12:10.78. While the gift of prophecy is not limited to prophets, 79. It is also true that not everyone who prophesies is a prophet, 1 Corinthians 12:29. Paul says, every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. 1 Corinthians 11 4 5. Thomas Gillespie, noting the difficulty of defining the word prophesying, states that 178 RICK Walston, the prophet and the gift of prophecy from Ph.D. Dis, 
the manifestations of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 with special emphasis upon tongues as evidence, Northwest University, 2000, 61 pages. 79 IBID 29 cannot derive a clear definition from a dictionary or the history of the term's usage. Point 80 Similarly, Anthony This Elton, warns against the dangers of imposing modern cultural or ecclesial assumptions onto one's definition of prophesying. Point 81 However, he suggests that Paul's reference to prophesying may include applied theological teaching, encouragement, and exhortation to build the church, not merely, if at all, ad hoc cries of an expressive, diagnostic, or tactical nature, delivered. As spontaneous many messages 82 Grudem S83 and Carson S84, who agrees with Grudem while issuing mild dissent on some points, views of the gift of prophecy differ from this Elton 85 MacArthur 86 and Hill.87 Though it may sound simplistic, the best conclusion as to what the gift of prophecy entails must come from and not exceed scripture. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware, 1 Corinthians 12 1, sets the context for chapters 12 to 14. Paul's purpose is to demystify spiritual gifts and give instruction for their proper use in the church. In 1 Corinthians 80 Thomas Gillespie, the first theologians, a study in early Christian prophecy, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1994, Logos Bible Software, p. 132. 81 Anthony This Elton, The First Epistle to the Corinthians, A Commentary on the Greek Text, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 2000, Logos Bible Software, p. 825. 82 Ibid, p. 826. 83 Grudem, Systematic Theology, p. 1049. 84 Carson, p. 92. 85 Grudem, The Gift of Prophecy, p. 118. 86 MacArthur, Biblical Doctrine, p. 812. 87 HILL, p. 123. 30 12 colon 4, Paul indicates the divine source of spiritual gifts, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. In the subsequent verses, Paul provides an illustrative listing of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12 colon 8 10. Through the use of two different Greek adjectives, Paul effectively indicates three groupings of spiritual gifts. The two adjectives Paul employs are alovi, alos, and eterovi, heteros. Although the adjectives are often interchangeable, 88 David Garland notes that the classical distinction between another of a different kind and alovi, another of the same kind, does not always hold true in Koine Greek. Paul may switch adjectives to divide the gifts into a threefold structure rather than simply to create stylistic variety. 89 Lenski concurs, separating the list into three sections 1. The gifts involving the intellect are wisdom and knowledge. 2. The gifts involving faith are faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, and discerning of spirits. 3. The gifts involving the tongue are tongues and the interpretation of tongues. 90 Importantly, Later in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul selects one gift from each section in his contrast between the permanence of love and the temporality of spiritual gifts. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away, if there are tongues, they will cease, if there is knowledge, it will be done away, 1 Corinthians 13 8. It is clear that Paul continues to have the spiritual gift of prophecy in mind. His 88 Gerhard Kittel, Gerhard Frederick, and Jeffrey Bromilly, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1985, Logos Bible Software, p. 43. 890 A.B.I.D. Garland, Baker Exegetically Commentary on the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Academic, 2003, Logos Bible Software, P. 579. 90 RCH Lenski, The Interpretation of St. Paul's First and Second Epistles to the Corinthians, Minneapolis, MN, Augsburg Publishing House, 1963, Logos Bible Software, P. 498.
31 opening remarks in chapter 14 do not break the continuity. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, 1 Corinthians 14 1. In the first half of chapter 14, Paul compares the gift of tongues to the gift of prophecy regarding each gift's effectiveness in edifying the church. In verses 26 to 28, he provides guidelines for the proper practice of the gift of tongues. Similarly, in verses 29 to 38, Paul gives instructions about how to use the gift of prophecy. One who seeks to understand the essential nature of the gift of prophecy must accurately interpret verse 29 and how its message coheres with the message of Romans 12 6 and 1 Thessalonians 5 19 22. Paul instructs, let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment, 1 Corinthians 14 29. Lenski suggests that the prophets are those in the congregation whom the Spirit enabled with a gift to offer a prophecy. Point 91 Regarding who is to do the judging, Bible interpreters are of two minds. MacArthur 92 and Lenski 93 conclude that other prophets present took on the responsibility of judging prophecies. Carson 94 and Grudem 95 assert that Paul intended the entire congregation to judge the prophecies. Their case is convincing for the following reasons. 1. Paul instructs the congregation at 91 Lenski, the interpretation of St. Paul's first and second epistles to the Corinthians, p. 610. 92 J.O.H.N. MacArthur, 1 Corinthians, the MacArthur New Testament Commentary, Chicago, I.L., Moody Press, 1984, Logos Bible Software, p. 389. 93 Lenski, the Interpretation of St. Paul's First and Second Epistles to the Corinthians, p. 610. 94 Carson, p. 119. 95 Grudem, The Gift of Prophecy, pages 60-62. 32 Thessalonica, Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5 colon 19 dash 22. In his general epistle, the Apostle John instructed his readers to test prophecies because many false prophets had gone out into the world, 1 John 4 colon 1 dash 6. The general nature of Paul's and John's instructions support a broader interpretation of those judging prophecies in 1 Corinthians 14 29. 2. Carson notes that there is no evidence that judging prophecies should be confused with the discerning of spirits. Point 96 Carson's point is valid. However, it raises a question about the content of the prophetic utterances in Corinth and Thessalonica. If the prophecies contained revelatory content, it would not seem reasonable for the congregation at large to discern the validity of such revelations. However, if the prophecies contained previously delivered revelation, the General Assembly would be able to discern if the message was congruent. Apart from the spiritual gift of discerning spirits or the gift of knowledge, there must be some standard against which they sifted the prophecies. Grudem asks, by what standards would such weighing of the prophecies be made? 97 He answers, elsewhere in the New Testament, the criterion for evaluation of public speech in the churches seems always to have been conformity to scripture or received teaching, Acts 17:11, 1 Cor 14:37-38, Galen 1:8, 1 John 4:2-3, 6. 98 Grudem's view that scripture or received teaching provides the criteria by which one judges prophecies implies that the content of 96 Carson, p. 120. 97 Grudem, the gift of prophecy, p. 60. 98 IBID 33 The prophecy itself is expected to conform to the same. Such a conclusion concurs with the message of Romans 12 6. The gift of prophecy differs from the prophets whom God gave to the church for the laying of her foundation, Ephesians 2:20, 3 5, 4 11. It also differs from non foundational prophets, i.e., Agabus, whom God also gave to the church for her edification and encouragement. The gift of prophecy was a divine endowment whereby God spoke through the gifted to encourage, instruct, and exhort by delivering previously revealed truth. As such, 
the prophecies were tested, weighed, or judged by the standard of written scripture or orthodox apostolic teaching. The relevancy of prophets and prophecy today is prophecy relevant for today. The Apostle Paul says yes, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away, if there are tongues, they will cease, if there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. 1 Corinthians 13 8-10 There is much debate over the significance of the consistent verb tense and voice Paul employed about prophecy and knowledge, which is different than the tense and voice of the verb he used concerning tongues. A lengthy discussion addressing the perpetuity of knowledge and prophecy versus tongues is not within the scope of this paper. However, what Paul says about the termination of prophecy is germane. In verse 8, Paul says, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. The verbal phrase, it will be done away comes from the root Greek word katarjo, katargavu, which means to render inactive, to condemn to inactivity, or to put out 34 of use 99. The passive voice of katarjo signifies that the subject is being affected by or is the receiver of the verbal action 100. Hence, Paul states that something in the future 101 will affect the subject prophecies 102 and render them inactive. Why will prophecy end and what future event will render the gift inactive? Paul answers both questions in verses 9 to 10, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Grudem rightly concludes that the limitations of prophecy are quantitative and as such necessitate their replacement by the coming of the perfect or complete. Point 103. However, Grudem's suggestion that the perfect, verse 10, refers to the return of Christ does not cohere with the neuter adjective telos, perfect. Kittle suggests that telos means completion as a state, perfection 104. The state of completion or perfection described by the adjective fits best with an eschatological condition not a person. When that condition arrives, believers will know fully just as they have been fully 99 Gerhard Kittel, Gerhard Frederick, and Jeffrey Bromilly, eds, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Volume 1. Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1985, Logos Bible Software, p. 452. 100 Matthew DeMoss, Pocket Dictionary for the Study of New Testament Greek, Downers Grove, I.L., Intervarsity Press, 2001, p. 95. 101 The word katargsintai, katargithisintai, is the future passive indicative third person plural form of the verb katargavu, katarjo, is a future tense. 102 The Greek phrase, translated but if there are gifts of prophecy in the New American Standard Bible, reads eiteida, prophetai, it de prophetai, which translated literally reads, but if prophecies. 103 Grudem, the gift of prophecy, p. 101. 104 Gerhard Kittel, Gerhard Frederick, and Jeffrey Bromilly, eds, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Volume 8. Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1985. Logos Bible Software, p. 49. 35 Known, 1 Corinthians 13 12. Lenski notes the aorist have been known fully is constitutive and includes all of God's knowledge regarding Paul and sums all of it up in 1.105 Paul's description of the believer's extensive knowledge of God when perfection comes, verses 12, emphatically describes the second half of the contrast between knowledge and prophecy and the perfect, verses 9 to 10. John Mark Ruthven, commenting on the coming of perfection, says, The eschatological principle is this, when the complete, and, arrives, at that precise point, the incomplete will be ended. 106 Carson rightly concludes about the coming of perfection, if this point can be located in the first or second century, then no putative gift of prophecy, knowledge, or tongues is valid today. 107 The Apostle John provides insight as to the initiating event that may render knowledge and prophecy obsolete. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is, 
1 John 3 colon 2. John alludes to the fact that at the time of his writing the letter, AD 85 to 90, 108 believers did not yet know what they would be like at the appearing of Christ. Although the author did not give a detailed account, he did state that they would be like him. Total transformation happens when, at his yet to 105 Lenski, the interpretation of St. Paul's first and second epistles to the Corinthians, p. 570. 106 J. O. N. Mark Ruthven, on the cessation of the Charismata, the Protestant polemic on post-biblical miracles, Tulsa, OK, Word and Spirit Press, 2011, Kindle Electronic Edition, Location 3764. 107 Carson, P. 1090. 108 G. L. E. N. Barker, The Expositor's Bible Commentary, 1 John, Volume 12. Edited by Frank Gabling, Grand Rapids, M. I. Zondervan, 1981, Logos Bible Software, p. 301. 36 Occur Second Coming, Believers Will See Christ As He Really Is 109 At That Time, Believers' Knowledge of the Lord Will Increase Exponentially To The Same Extent That The Lord Knows Them, i.e., Fully. The Implications Of Such Perfect Knowledge Would Naturally Render The Gift Of Knowledge Obsolete, 1 Corinthians 13:10. Although complete knowledge renders the gift of knowledge obsolete, it does not necessarily hold true for the gift of prophecy. After Christ's return, Revelation 19,11-16, prophecy continues. The birth of children during the millennium, Isaiah 65,20, implies that the proclamation of God's word continues. Through the prophet Isaiah, God revealed that during the time of the millennium, Jerusalem would become the hub for the knowledge of God, into which nations will stream and learn his ways, Isaiah 2,2-4. At the end of the millennium the final judgment occurs, Revelation 20,11-15. Then, in their eternal state, all that remains are believers who possess perfect knowledge. As long as people need someone to serve as an intermediary and messenger of divine truth, which is the condition of the present time, prophecy remains as a relevant and useful gift of the Holy Spirit. Until such time that ignorance and unbelief do not exist, i.e., in the eternal state, knowledge and prophecy will continue as relevant gifts of the Holy Spirit. Conclusion The Old Testament prophets were servants who received a divine message from the Lord and then communicated that message to God's people without error or 109 Stephen Smalley, 1, 2, 3 John, Word Biblical Commentary, Vol. 51, Dallas, TX, Word Incorporated, 1989, Logos Bible Software, P146. 37 Deliberate Tampering with Its Content. Accurate transmission of messages and inherently fulfilled predictions served as the primary distinctions between true and false prophets. True prophets were those whose message did not contradict previously delivered truth, and whose predictions came true. Contradictory messages or failed predictions meant that the prophet was either a false prophet or a presumptuous prophet. In either case, their punishment was capital, Deuteronomy 13,5, 1820. The criteria by which validation of Old Testament prophecies occurred continued to be the standard for New Testament prophecies as well. However, with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the giving of spiritual gifts, prophecy in the New Testament took on an added dimension. God called and gifted some prophets to the church whose ministry was revelatory and foundational, Ephesians 2:20, 3:5. To others, God gave the gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12:10. The gift of prophecy was the proclamation of previously delivered revelation, Romans 12:6 and its hearers were to test each prophetic utterance for accuracy and consistency with that truth, 1 Thessalonians 5 colon 19-22, 1 Corinthians 14 29. The eternal state of believers, to which Paul refers as the perfect, 1 Corinthians 13 10, marks the end of prophecy and all spiritual gifts. Until that time instructs Paul, the church is not to despise prophetic utterances, 1 Thessalonians 5 20. Instead, 
believers who have the gift of prophecy are faithful to deliver utterances consistent with God's word, Romans 12 colon 6, and those who hear must examine everything carefully resulting in their embrace of truth and avoidance of error, 1 Thessalonians 5 19. By this practice of prophecy in the church, believers are edified just as Paul exhorted, let all things be done for edification, 1 Corinthians 14 26. 38 Bibliography Alland, Kurd, Barbara Alland, Johannes Caravido Polas, Carlo Martini, and Bruce Metzger. Novum Testamentum Grice. 28 Ed. Stuttgart, De, Deutsche Bielgesellschaft, 2012. Logos Bible Software. Arndt, William, Frederick Danker, Walter Bauer, and F. Wilbur Gingrich. A Greek-English Lexicon of the New Testament and Other Early Christian Literature. Chicago, I.L., The University of Chicago Press, 2000. Logos Bible Software. On, David E. Prophecy in Early Christianity and the Ancient Mediterranean World. Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1983. Barker, Glenn. The Expositor's Bible Commentary, 1 John. Volume 12. Edited by Frank Gabelin. Grand Rapids, M.I., Zondervan, 1981. Logos Bible Software. Beasley, Michael John. The Fallible Prophets of New Calvinism, an analysis, critique, and exhortation concerning the contemporary doctrine of fallible prophecy. Faftown, N.C., The Armory Ministries, 2013. Beasley Murray, George. Word Biblical Commentary, John. Volume 36. Dallas, TX, Word, 2002. Logos Bible Software. Brown, Paul E. Deuteronomy, An Expositional Commentary. Leminster, UK, Day 1 Publications, 2008. Logos Bible Software. Bruce, FF Word Biblical Commentary, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Volume 45. Dallas, TX, Word, 1998. Logos Bible Software. Calvin, John. Commentary on the Epistle of Paul to the Romans. Translated by John Owen. Bellingham, WA, Logos Bible Software, 2010. Logos Bible Software. Carson, D. A. R. T. France, J. A. Modier, and Gordon Wenham E.D.S. New Bible Commentary. 4th ed. Lester, UK, Intervarsity Press, 1994. Logos Bible Software. Underscore 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 underscore. Showing the Spirit. A Theological Exposition of 1 Corinthians 12-14 Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Books, 1987 Kindle Electronic Edition Christensen, Duane Word Biblical Commentary, Deuteronomy 1-21-9 Volume 6A Edited by John D. W. Watts Nashville, T.N., Thomas Nelson, 2001 Logos Bible Software. 39 Deer, Jack. Deuteronomy, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, An Exposition of the Scriptures. Volume 1. Edited by John Walvoord and Roy Zuck. Wheaton, I.L., Victor Books, 1983. Logos Bible Software. Demos, Matthew. Pocket Dictionary for the Study of New Testament Greek. Downers Grove, I.L., Intervarsity Press, 2001. Duffield, Guy P. and Van Cleve, Nathaniel M. Foundations of Pentecostal Theology. San Dimas, C.A., L.I.F.E. Bible College, 1987. Logos Bible Software. Frederick Gerhardt. Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Ten volumes edited by Gerhard Kittel, Jeffrey Bromilly, and Gerhard Frederick. Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1964. 
Logos Bible Software Gaffin, Richard Perspectives on Pentecost, New Testament Teaching on the Gifts of the Holy Spirit Phillipsburg, New Jersey, Presbyterian and Reformed, 1979 Garland, David Baker Exegetically Commentary on the New Testament, 1 Corinthians Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Academic, 2003 Logos Bible Software Gentry, Kenneth The Charismatic Gift of Prophecy Fountain in, S.C., Victorious Hope Publishing, 1989 Gillespie, Thomas The First Theologian, A Study in Early Christian Prophecy Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1994 Logos Bible Software Grudem, Wayne, ed. Are Miraculous Gifts for Today? Four Views Grand Rapids, M.I., Zondervan, 1996 Kindle Electronic Edition Underscore 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 The Gift of Prophecy in the New Testament and Today Wheaton, I.L., Crossway Books, 2000 Kindle Electronic Edition Guy, Harold A. New Testament Prophecy, Its Origin and Significance London, UK, The Epworth Press, 1947 Harris, Robert L., Gleason L. Archer, and Bruce K. Waldke, E.D.S. Theological Wordbook of the Old Testament Chicago, I.L., Moody Press, 1999 Logos Bible Software Hendrickson, William and Simon Kistmaker New Testament Commentary, Exposition of Ephesians Volume 7 Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Books, 2000 Logos Bible Software Hill, David New Testament Prophecy Peter Toon, ed. Basingstoke, UK, Marshall Morgan and Scott, 1979 Forty Lenski, R.C.H. The Interpretation of St. Paul's First and Second Epistles to the Corinthians Minneapolis, M.N., Augsburg Publishing House, 1963 Logos Bible Software Underscore 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 the Interpretation of St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans Columbus, O. Lutheran Book Concern, 1936 Logos Bible Software Underscore 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 The Interpretation of St. Paul's Epistle to the Galatians, to the Ephesians and to the Philippians Columbus, O. Lutheran Book Concern, 1937 Logos Bible Software Lincoln, Andrew Word Biblical Commentary, Ephesians Dallas, TX, Word, 1990 Logos Bible Software Lou, Johannes and Eugene A. Nita Greek-English Lexicon of the New Testament, Based on Semantic Domains Volume 1 New York, New York, United Bible Societies 1996 Logos Bible Software MacArthur, John and Richard Mayhew, EDS Biblical Doctrine, A Systematic Summary of Bible Truth Wheaton, I.L., Crossway Books, 2017 Underscore 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 Ed. The MacArthur Study Bible Nashville, T.N. Word Publishing, 1997 Logos Bible Software Underscore 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 MacArthur New Testament Commentary, 1 Corinthians Chicago, I.L., Moody Press, 1984 Logos Bible Software Morris, Leon The Pillar New Testament Commentary the Epistle to the Romans. Grand Rapids, M.I., InterVarsity Press, 1988. Logos Bible Software. 
Ram, Bernard. Protestant Biblical Interpretation, A Textbook of Hermeneutics. Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Academic, 1970. Robertson, A.T. A Grammar of the Greek New Testament in the Light of Historical Research. Nashville, T.N., Broadman Press, 1934. Logos Bible Software. Ruthven, John Mark. On the Cessation of the Charismata, the Protestant Polemic on Post-Biblical Miracles. Tulsa, OK, Word and Spirit Press, 2011. Kindle Electronic Edition. Schaff, Philip and David Sly Schaff. History of the Christian Church. Volume 2. New York, New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1910. Logos Bible Software. Schlink, Basilea. Ruled by the Spirit. Translated by John and Mary Foote and Michael Harper. Minneapolis, M.N., Bethany, 1969. 41 Schreiner, Thomas. Baker Exegetically Commentary of the New Testament, Romans. Volume 6. Grand Rapids, M.I., Baker Books, 1998. Logos Bible Software. Smalley, Stephen. Word Biblical Commentary, 1, 2, 3 John. Volume 51. Dallas, TX, Word, 1989. Logos Bible Software. Sproul, R.C. The Gospel of God, An Exposition of Romans. Ross Shire, UK, Christian Focus, 1994. Logos Bible Software. Tenney, Merrill, and Richard Longnecker. The Expositor's Bible Commentary, John and Acts. Volume 9. Edited by Frank Gabelin. Grand Rapids, M.I., Zondervan, 1981. Logos Bible Software. This Elton, Anthony. The First Epistle to the Corinthians, A Commentary on the Greek Text. Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 2000. Logos Bible Software. Thomas, Robert, L. Understanding Spiritual Gifts, a verse-by-verse -verse study of 1 Corinthians 12-14. Grand Rapids, M.I., Craigle Publications, 1999. Walston, Rick. The Manifestations of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 with special emphasis upon tongues as evidence. Ph.D. Dis, Northwest University, 2000. Wanamaker, Charles. The Epistles to the Thessalonians, A Commentary on the Greek Text. Grand Rapids, M.I., Eerdmans, 1990. Logos Bible Software. Whitmer, John. Romans the Bible Knowledge Commentary, An Exposition of Scripture. Volume 2. Edited by John Walvoord and Roy Zuck. Wheaton, I.L., Victor Books, 1985. Logos Bible Software. Zierwick, Max and Mary Grosvenor. A Grammatical Analysis of the Greek New Testament. Rome, I.T., Biblical Institute Press, 1974. Logos Bible Software. 42.